A 75-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia and arterial hypertension presents with a two-day history of fever with a body temperature up to 39.5 degrees Celsius, chills, rigors and vomiting. When she arrives at the emergency department, her blood pressure is 105 over 65 and her heart rate is 97. She is alert and awake, but she is agitated and breathing rapidly with a rate of 32 breaths per minute. Her O2 saturation is still normal. Upon examination, the doctor detects pain on palpation in the lower back near the spine. Dipstick urinalysis comes back positive for nitrites and leukocyte esterase. The doctor, of course, diagnoses acute pyelonephritis and promptly starts antibiotics. IV ciprofloxacin. Now, assuming that the diagnosis is correct, do you agree with the doctor's choice of antibiotics? Feel free to pause the video to think for a minute and in the meantime, do click the like button so that I know that you like these short clinical cases and I'll be sure to make more. Ok, ciprofloxacin achieves high concentrations throughout the urinary tract in the urinary bladder, the kidneys and even the prostate. It's no wonder then that it's listed as the number one treatment option for acute pyelonephritis and prostatitis in many guidelines. However, there is a major problem here. Since this antibiotic is one of the most overused antibiotics globally, many bacteria including many strains of our garden variety E. coli have become resistant to it. In many European countries and in the US, resistance rates of E. coli exceed 10 or even 20%. And that is just E. coli. Don't forget that there are other bacteria to worry about like Klebsiella pneumoniae, which are even more likely to be resistant. This is the situation in Europe and don't even get me started on the rest of the world. For UTIs with systemic symptoms like acute pyelonephritis and acute prostatitis, we want to use an antibiotic with more than a 90% likelihood of effectiveness. 90%. If the patient is septic or in septic shock, we want to be as close to 100% certain that the antibiotic will work. This patient, for example, is relatively hypotensive and she is breathing rapidly. There are definitely signs of sepsis here, so we don't want to mess around with antibiotics. Unfortunately, in many countries, ciprofloxacin is nowhere near these numbers anymore. It used to be a very reliable drug for UTIs, but now we've compromised its effectiveness. If you've seen my course on antibiotics, you already know that full well. In short, if you want to use ciprofloxacin or its cousin levofloxacin for the empirical treatment of UTIs, you first have to know the resistance rates in your country. At the very least, you should check the yearly ECDC or CDC reports on bacterial resistance, focusing primarily on E. coli. If more than 10% of isolates are resistant to ciprofloxacin, if your patient has already taken ciprofloxacin recently, or if they've taken other antibiotics, or if there is another reason to suspect resistance, you either need to add another antibiotic as backup for empirical therapy, right? or you should use a completely different antibiotic altogether. This is especially important if your patient is severely ill or at high risk of complications, like this patient in this example. If you've seen my course on antibiotics in clinical practice, I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, the link to the demo version is right here in the description. Even this demo version is packed with useful information and it contains the two most important lessons about antibiotics for every clinician. If you use antibiotics in practice, I'm certain you will quickly realize how valuable this is and you will love the course. I hope to see you there. Take care.